If you'll go with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18 and verse 30. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, and we're going to read verses 30 and then jump down to verse 38 in the same chapter. But before we do the reading, I want to mention something. We have felt since the beginning of the year, we were praying and asking God for direction, what he wants to do in our church. And obviously, we've shared many things already. But I have felt from the Lord that in this month of March, that we focus a little bit more on the idea of consecration a drawing closer to God, a separating ourselves possibly from certain things that crowd our minds, crowd our hearts, and possibly even crowd our lives that keep us from developing a more intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in prayer, that was, it was impressed upon me last month that we give an entire week to the Lord of consecration. And so at the end of this month, the, ver the days 25th through the 28th, that's a Monday through a Thursday. We're calling the entire church to a time of consecration. We're going to be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night at 7 p.m. to pray. We're going to pray. As a church, as a body of believers, someone who is like, oh, I don't like to pray. Well, this is that week where you learn how to pray. We're going to help you and encourage you because I believe more than ever before we need to draw closer to Jesus. We need to separate ourselves from people and things possibly that we've tolerated, that we've played around with, that we haven't totally disconnected from. And so we're calling the church to a week of consecration. This is for everybody. We will be here. We're calling the ministry to be here with their wives and families, the leadership, every volunteer, every member of this church. This is not a week off. You know, I know on Thursday nights we normally have Bible study and someone's like, ooh, finally a day off. No, 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 no. no. It's not going to be one of those kind of weeks. We're going to be here every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, praying, seeking God. We're going to allow the Holy Ghost to speak to us and through us to pray for specific needs and areas. We want God to move. We want revival to happen. We want to move with the Holy Ghost. All those things are byproducts when you draw closer to God. When you set your heart and your mind to seek the Lord, you unleash the glory of God and the miraculous and the move of God's spirit. And so we want God to have his way in our lives and in this church. So I want you to mark that in your calendar, March the 25th through the 28th. Arrange your schedule. I'm telling you almost a month in advance to arrange your schedule Make, make sure you can be here 7 o'clock. We're going to pray. The entire church, English and Spanish service, we're going to pray. We're going to seek the Lord. We're going to pray for the families of this church. We're going to pray for the marriages of this church. We're going to pray for God to heal every sick person in this church. We're going to pray for God to move mightily and bring revival and awakening to this church. We're going to pray for a harvest of souls like we've never seen before. And this week will culminate on Friday with our Good Friday service because that week is the Holy Week. That's the Passion Week, as many would refer to it. And that Friday is Good Friday. And we're going to come here. We're going to partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper. We're going to have communion together. Where we're going to remember the sacrifice that Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary, the power of his blood. And we're believing that by the time we get to Easter Sunday, that Sunday, we're going to experience resurrection power like we've never before. How many of you will believe that with me? That as we focus our attention on God for that week as a church body, that God is going to begin to move in a mighty way. And so I just want to set that in your hearts and give you enough time in advance. Nobody's going to be surprised by that. Nobody's going to come on Monday and go, oh, this week's a prayer week. Oh, no, 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 no. We're going to be announcing it every single week. It's going to be on our social media platform. We're going to get the word out there because we're going to be here seeking the Lord. How many of you want to join us? How many will commit to joining us, to seeking the face of God? And so I feel from the Lord to start all of this journey today with this word that God's laid upon my heart. First Kings chapter 18 and verse number 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him 
and he repaired. I want you to notice that. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Verse 38, same chapter. Then the fire, someone say, then the fire. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. I want to minister for a few moments. The Lord would help me from the subject. First the altar, then the fire. First the altar, then the fire. We want the fire of the Holy Ghost to fall upon our lives and our church in this hour like never before. We want the Spirit of Almighty God to visit us, to speak to us, to challenge us, to lead us, to guide us, to move us in whatever direction that God wants to do that. But in order for the fire to fall in our lives, there's some things that need to happen. Fire had an important function in service to the Lord in the tabernacle of meeting and in the temple in the Old Testament. And because the fire that was burning in the temple had been started by God himself when they dedicated the very temple to the Lord, it had to be burning continually. It's interesting. We don't have time to dive into all of that, but it was God that started the fire. The priest would lay the sacrifice that very first sacrifice had been laid and immediately the fire of God's spirit fell and consumed that sacrifice. But then God commanded those very same priests, you make sure that this fire continually burns, that it never goes out, that you add as much wood as you need to, you take care of it as you travel, as you go about, but make sure that fire does not burn out. And I submit to you today, that it's God that starts the fire in our life. It's God that allows us to feel his spirit and be filled with the fire of the Holy Ghost. But then it becomes our responsibility to keep the fire burning. The figure of fire in the scriptures was used to symbolize many things. In Ezekiel chapter 1, it symbolized the glory of God. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17 we have a story of where the prophet and his servant had been surrounded by an army. The servant, all he could see was the army, and the Lord allowed the prophet to be able to speak so his servant could have his eyes open and notice that there was a greater army around this army, an army of angels. And so the fire in that particular story symbolized the protecting presence of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 24, the fire symbolized the holiness of God. Zechariah 13 and 9, it symbolized God's righteous judgment. In Isaiah chapter 66, 15 and 16, the fire symbolized God's wrath against sin. But now in this dispensation of grace that we find ourselves in today, the figure of God's fire is used to reference the power of the Holy Ghost. And this divine fire, like the fire in that temple, must also be continually burned. I believe we all would be in agreement when I say that the church of today needs the fire of the Holy Ghost like never before. I'll say that again. The church of today needs the fire of the Holy Ghost like never before. I'm not just speaking of good church services. I'm not just talking about a feeling of excitement in our churches, but a fire that consumes sin. I said a fire that consumes sin. It's a fire that consumes apathy and religiosity. A fire that brings conviction. That's when you know that there's real Holy Ghost fire. I've been in services where the Holy Ghost fire falls so strongly that people can't keep what's going on in their lives to themselves. I was in a youth camp and one occasion, the fire of the Holy Ghost fell so strongly that there was such a conviction that began to move that people were coming up to the altar and started confessing things to me. 
They said, preacher, I don't know who to tell, but I got to get this off my chest. And they began to confess things that they had been involved in, lifestyles that they were living, things that they had just had done. They were handing me crack pipes and bags of marijuana and all these different things. They said, I can't hold on to this anymore. That's when you know the fire of the Holy Ghost has fallen. Now, I'm going to date myself a little bit and tell you how really long I've been doing this. But I was preaching in a service, and it was another youth camp. We began to preach so strongly with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and God showed up that the kids were running to their cars, running to their cabins to bring their worldly music CDs and throw them on the altar. Now, the young folks don't know what CDs are, but it just tells you how long I've been doing this. There was such a conviction that fell on that entire camp that they were running to their cars and bringing their books and, uh, and all these CDs and throwing them. Some kids were getting so convicted, they were breaking them and throwing them on the altar, going to their cabins and, and bringing things. There was a young man that brought a bottle of vodka and laid it on the platform. He said, preacher, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. That's the kind of fire I want to fall in this church. Oh, I got some nervous clappers right there, but I'll say that again. That's the kind of fire that we need to fall in this church. Where folks get so uncomfortable and realize, I can't live this way anymore. I can't do these kinds of things anymore. I can't be around those kind of people anymore because God is calling me to, this is the fire of the Holy Ghost. That's what this church needs. That's what our city needs. Fire that brings conviction. Fire that brings unity. And then inspires the church to acts of service. A fire that genuinely draws us closer to God. Let me just say this. This fire cannot be manufactured by man. A man doesn't spark this fire. It doesn't elicit that kind of response. It's a heavenly visitation of God that comes and consumes our sacrifices. It's not a fire that can be manufactured by man or ignited by an intellectual program. It is of divine origin, and it comes from the very throne of God. And I don't know about you, but I want that kind of fire. Is there anybody in this building that wants that kind of fire? A fire that purifies, a fire that cleanses. And if we want this holy fire, there are some things that we're going to have to do first. The prophet Elijah teaches us how this holy fire is started. So I want to walk you through some steps. That if we pattern these actions according to what we find in this Bible story, we'll have the same fire fall in our lives and on our church. Number one, we read it in verse 30. He repaired that altar that was broken down. Someone say repair the altar. This is first the foundation of all of this. Although this was done under the old covenant, I believe the principle is still the same today. Why do we need an altar? I'm not talking about just this front area, although this is dedicated as an altar area here in this church. But I'm talking about a place that you have with the Lord. That is your altar. That time that you set aside whenever it is in your day to seek the Lord in prayer and consecration. You open up your Bible, you have some devotional time, you read the scriptures. That is what in this particular dispensation of grace we call an altar. Now if that sounds strange to somebody here today, this is the mercy of God calling you to build your very own altar. Say, preacher, I don't, I don't do anything like that. I, I didn't even know that was required. It's not required, it's something that you and I need to do. I need to have a time with the Lord every single day. 
I need to be in his presence. I need for his love to fill my life. I need the reassurance that he is with me walking every day. I need to be able to open up my Bible and have principles that I can apply to my life and live out every single day. That's the purpose of an altar. I promise you, if you have an altar, you won't struggle as much in your Christian life. I know the altar builders in this church. I know who they are. I watch and I observe. And so altar builders don't struggle with their walk with God. That doesn't mean they're not visited by difficulties and tragedies and suffering. That just means that they keep going no matter what's going on. I'm inviting everybody under the sound of my voice, become an altar builder. Get up every morning, set your alarm clock a half an hour earlier, an hour earlier to seek the Lord. Stay up a little bit later at night or whatever you got to do to be able to seek God in the stillness of the morning or the stillness of the night, whatever time best suits you. But you got to get a hold of God and talk to God and let him talk to you. That's how you build an altar. But let's get a little bit deeper here today. Why do we need an altar? Let me put it to you very simply. You need an altar to die on it. In the Old Testament, if you found an altar, you found a place of death. If you looked at an altar in the Old Testament a little bit closer, you'd find find remains of an animal on there. Unfortunately, in today's altar, people gather simply for blessings and things to be added to their lives. The altar is not the gathering place, my dear brother and friend, for the bless me club. Well, I'm going to go to my altar to get a blessing. Well, why don't you throw yourself on the altar first? And say, Jesus, here are my hangups. Here are my habits. Here are my issues. Here are the areas of my life that need improvement. And if you'll get on that altar and die, once that sacrifice hits that altar, guess what happens? The blessing will come. The fire will fall. The Holy Ghost will fall. I'm going to lay myself on the altar first. Can God bless me on an altar? You better believe he can. Can God touch my life in a supernatural way at an altar? He has and he will continue. But can I tell you, the altar is for a place for us to lay down and die. What do you mean by that, preacher? Die to self. Selfish desires. Selfish ambitions. What the flesh wants. That altar comes at a place in your life to remind your flesh you are not in charge. I set apart that time for the Lord to remind myself the devil, the flesh, and the world. There's a king that reigns supreme in my life. His name is Jesus. And when you don't have an altar, you're living by the dictates of your flesh. What do you mean, preacher? That means you do whatever you want to do. I don't feel like praying, so I'm not going to pray. That's an altarless life. I got a Bible for Christmas, but I haven't opened it. Altarless life. Fasting? What is fasting? Altarless life. Are you coming to Bible study on Thursday? No, altarless life. That's okay. I don't need a name, man. I just want to make sure you're still awake. What got into the pastor this morning? I'll tell you what got into the pastor this morning. God is calling all of us to consecrate ourselves. And in 2024, this is not the preaching that is shared on social media. This is not the candy-covered, sugar-coated, chocolate-tasting, warm and fuzzy, quotable thing that is shared on social media. 
but this is the stuff that changes lives. This is the kind of thing that alters destinies. This is the kind of thing that breaks generational curses. This is the kind of thing that lifts addiction and the chains of bondage off of somebody's life. This is what we need. Things are removed from our lives at an altar. I'm talking to somebody that's been hitting their head against the wall of late, saying, how can I get free of this? How can I overcome this thing that's been gri- had a grip on my life for so long? You've got to start building an altar. When you have been to an altar and you've died to self, it's no longer you who live. But just like the scripture says, it's Christ who lives in you. You no longer live to see your goals realized. But you now live to accomplish his divine purpose and mission for your life. If your life is still all about you, you haven't died on an altar. Somebody just said, I picked the wrong Sunday to come to church. I just felt it in the Holy Ghost. I'm, I wish it was a joke, but I just felt that in the Holy Ghost. Man, I wish that I came to that service where he's talking about bless me and the good things. You'll get the blessing and the good things when you go through the altar. How do you know that, preacher? Because that's what happened to many of us. We decided, I'm going to build an altar. I'm going to draw myself closer to Jesus. I'm going to do whatever it takes every day to be closer to Jesus. And guess what happened? Things started falling off of our lives. Habits became broken. Lifestyles began to change. The typology of the altar speaks of our heart. You see, God wants us to repair the altar of our heart. Did you know that we all have an altar in our heart? The question is, who is the God of that altar? Could it be our possessions, our family, our money? For some, it might even be their ministry. Or am I the God of my altar? But I have to ask myself the question, is Jesus really the God of my altar? Am I living truly for him? Or am I just living for myself? Am I living to accomplish? Am I living to gain access to things? Am I living simply to add things to my life? Then that simply means I need an altar. Maybe there's some of us in this room that need to repair our broken down altar. That at one time we were focused on the things of God. At one time we were seeking the Lord with all of our heart. And this is what we have as an example of our text here today that somebody had to stand up and repair the broken down altar. I'm calling in the Holy Ghost here today to every single one of us, this preacher included, that if it's needed, we need to repair our altar. We need to get that prayer life back together again. We need to make it a habit of getting into the scriptures every single day. We need to live a Christ-centered, Christ-focused life. What am I trying to say here today? The next thing I want you to know is I need to rebuild that altar that has been broken down because of sin and neglect. Those are the two reasons why altars get broken down. The first, in my opinion, happens because of neglect. We just stop praying. We just, it's no longer a habit. We don't see the importance of seeking the face of God. And so we neglect our altar. If you've neglected your altar, it's time to repair it today. If you neglected that time with the Lord, but Pastor, we're just, we're just so busy. That's the problem. We will make time for everything else but the Lord. Your kid got a sports thing, man, you'll get off early from work. 
The boss says, hey, that's, that's your pay. Hey, but I got to be there. But pastor, that's my son. That's my daughter. You have that son and daughter because of We'll trip over ourselves if our boss says, I need you here on Saturday. And we go home and have to explain to our family, you know what, I know we were going to go to the park on Saturday, but I can't do it. I got to work. The boss needs me. Why won't we do the same thing for the Lord? Well, I know we had these plans, but you know what? The pastor is saying we're going to be here every night at 7 p.m. to pray and seek the Lord. You go home and tell your wife and your kids, we're going to be at church Monday through Thursday at 7. Why? Because God's calling us to seek him. Oh, I need some help here today. I feel there's a discomfort that just hit this building. And that's okay. Because my job is to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. And some of us have been coasting for way too long, making it someone else's job to pray. Well, pray for me, brother, pray for me. Yes, but when are you going to start praying for yourself? Pray for my family, Pastor. You better believe it. But if we pray together and we touch and agree like we preached a couple weeks ago, then God will hear and God will answer. I know this is in the will of God now. I had so many doubts this morning, but right now watching your faces, I know this is God's will. I know it. I feel it in my bones. Because someone's about to make some decisions here today that are going to change your life forever. Somebody's about to finally get free and delivered after this service is over. Sin keeps me from God. Someone that is walking with God is going to want to be closer to him. But when sin creeps into our life, we have example after example in our Bible. You can go all the way to the beginning in Genesis. And see that when sin creeps in to the heart of a human being, it causes us to distance ourselves from God. We don't want to be in God's presence because there's sin there. We don't want to be in his house because there's sin in my life. I don't want to be around his people. Why? Because there's sin. Because sin creates a divide between me and God and me and my altar. It then becomes easier to just go through the motions and do things without stopping at the altar. And because of this, I neglect my consecration and my personal relationship with God. If this has happened in my life, I need to repair my altar. And can I tell you, this can happen to every single one of us in this building. We allow sin to creep into our lives and we slowly start neglecting our personal altar. But I've come under the anointing of the Holy Ghost to tell somebody it's time to repair your altar. It's time to repent. It's time to cry out to God. It's time to draw closer to him and watch the fire fall again on the altar of your heart. Because repentance is still in the Bible. It's not just something you do before you get baptized. It's the way that you live. God, forgive me for that thought I just thought. God, forgive me for this thing that I just... That's, that's a lifestyle of repentance. I don't want to let 24 hours go by before repenting before the Lord. That's a lifestyle of repentance. That's me making sure there's nothing in between me and God. There's nothing separating me from God and me from my altar. And so today, somebody just might have to repair their altar. Let me keep going here. The second thing that Elijah the prophet does so that the fire would fall was that he made a trench around the altar. You find that in verse 32. Why would the prophet make a trench? He simply made the trench to mark the ground. Pretty much he was saying, from here, this trench, this way, it all belongs to God. And from here, outside that trench, belongs to the enemy. 
He did it in such a way so that they would know that there is a difference between what is offered to God and what had been offered to the other false gods and the other idols. The trench was done to show God's people that which is given to God must be holy. It must be sanctified because a holy God deserves a holy, pure sacrifice. The prophets of Baal had gone before. Elijah had challenged them and told them, let the God that answered by fire, let him be the true God. And Baal, comically, the, la the, la the lame Baal literally means the God of fire. And so he said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And they get up there and do their thing and they make a mess of the altar. So the prophet goes and repairs it, creates this trench, cleanses it. Why? He says, because my God deserves a holy sacrifice. And can I tell you, it's still the same today. Our God deserves holy worship. Our God deserves pure sacrifice. Not what we give anybody and anything else, but he deserves the very best. God didn't want the remnants of the previous sacrifice. He wanted a holy offering. God's people were being shown that holy fire requires a holy sacrifice. But this trench also represents separation. Someone say separation. It speaks to us of separation from the world and its influence. Did you know that we are a separate people? We have been set apart and separated by God for holy things. That's why there are things that we don't do, not because there are rules and regulations, but because we want to honor God and be holy before him. There are places that we don't go there are lifestyles that we are not involved in, not because we feel like we're better than anybody else, not because a pastor is asking us to do it, because it's written in God's holy word that we are a holy and separate people. You and I ought to be different in everything that we do from everybody else. We should walk into our office spaces there, walk into our jobs in our neighborhoods, and there should be a noticeable difference in how we carry ourselves how we live, and the choices that we make. We are not called to mix in. We're called to stand out. And from the beginning, God has always separated his people. We can't forget in 2024 what the scriptures declare. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17, look at what it says. Therefore, come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. There must be a line of separation between us and the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't live like the world. We don't dress like the world. We don't do what the world does. We don't follow the world's influences. That's what it means to be separate. And in 2024, this is still relevant. We are called to be different. Someone say different. And this is what Elijah, the prophet, was trying to teach God's people. We are different. We live different. And we worship different. We are in this world. But hear me. We're not of this world. The old saints used to say, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We are not supposed to be comfortable in this world. The moment you and I start feeling comfortable in this world, that means we've made ourselves of this world. There should always be a constant discomfort in you when you see the world around you. When you see how people think and when you see how they act and how they live, there should be a discomfort in us. Why? Because we are not from here. We're from another world. 
And so here the prophet is saying, if you're going to sacrifice something to God, if you're going to give something to God, it must be holy. Can't be blemished. Can't be less than. It must be holy. Why? Because a strange sacrifice would produce a strange fire. But a holy sacrifice produces a holy fire. And if we want God's fire to fall upon our lives, these are the things that we're going to need to do. Friend that is visiting here today, friend that hasn't quite made Jesus the Lord of your life and surrendered your life, can I encourage you today, make up in your mind that you're going to serve the Lord and cast away whatever it is that you have to cast away. Turn your back on whatever you have to turn your back on and say, God, help me to make those changes that I need to make. Help me to take those positive steps towards you. That's the only way it's going to work. You can't hold on to the things of this world and get a hold of God's promises at the same time. You're going to have to let go of one. And I pray today that someone's hearing me, hearing the word of the Lord, that you let go of the things of the world. You let go of that lifestyle. You let go of that way of thinking. You let go of that way of living and saying, God, I want to fully surrender to you. I want to build my altar. I want, to, I want your fire, the fire of your spirit, your presence to fall upon my life and my family. When we talk about repairing the altar, it's literally in reference to true repentance. The prophet understood that the fire would not fall on an impure, broken down altar, but he took time to repair it. Can I just say that if we're going to see genuine revival in our church and in our city, we must take time to repent. We must acknowledge that there's some things in our lives that grieve the heart of God. You've got to acknowledge that there's some things that may possibly have attached themselves to my life that are contrary to God's word and God's will, that I got to repent. I know it's not talked about too much today, and it's unfortunate. But I'm here to tell you that if we're going to see a visitation of God's spirit like never before, it includes repentance. It's being sorry for our sins but sorry enough that we stop doing them. Parents, you know what I'm talking about when your kid says sorry for the same thing? You're kind of like, okay, sorry, but okay, are you going to stop doing it? I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Mom. That's wonderful, but are you going to stop? And some of us are the same way with God. Lord, I'm sorry. God's like, that's great. Are you going to stop? Are you going to stop going back to that relationship? Are you going to stop going to the bar? Are you going to stop going back and getting your fix? Are you going to stop doing those things and making those kind of decisions? Because repentance says, I'm done. No more. I'm not going down that road anymore. I'm not getting involved in that stuff anymore. I'm not getting my life get wrapped up in those things. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn my back, and I'm going to follow Jesus with everything that I have. And I know that there's some of us that are uncomfortable in this room, but there's somebody hearing me right now that says, that's what I'm looking for. I want to be free of this once and for all. I want to be changed. I want to be delivered. I want Jesus to do something new in my life. I'm talking to you. Today can be your day. All you have to do is come to a place of repentance and say, God, I'm done. And that's why some of us can't repent because we're not done yet. I'm not done yet, Pastor, I know. That's why you can't repent. But when you're done, say, I'm done. I'm done being an alcoholic. I'm done being an addict. I'm done with that life. I'm done being overwhelmed by sin. I'm done being tied up in depression. I'm done living confused. When you're done, then you can repent. And when you repent, the fire will fall upon your life and feel every emptiness and every area of your heart. But it has to come through repentance. Someone say repentance. Revival doesn't start on a platform. It starts in prayer. What are you trying to tell us today, Pastor? Let me give this to you. God will begin to move like never before. We will begin to seek him like never before. I'll say that again. God will begin to move 
like never before, when we begin to seek him like never before. We need a mighty visitation of the Holy Ghost in this hour where every sick person's healed, where every broken family is restored, where every devastated life finds purpose and direction. That's the kind of revival that we want to see happen. But hear me, we're not going to see God move like never before until we seek him like never before. Until we add another half hour to our prayer. Until we add a day of fasting to our week. Until we add another day of fasting. Until we seek God like we never have before. But we get off social media for a period of time and say, it's been wasting too much of my time. I'm going to set my heart to seek the Lord. And we turn off the TV and we maybe put a pause on that hobby just for a little bit because it's taking up more of my time and I need to seek God like I never have before. That's when you know that we're serious. For some of us, like, social media pastor? Oh. I think it's funny. Again, you can stop the record button if you feel like it, guys, back there. But I think it's funny. When someone says, I'm getting off for social media right now, and the next day they're liking and they're commenting, you're like. Guys, you're not going to be able to reach me for the next several weeks because I'm going to seek the Lord. And then the next day, happy birthday. Hey, so <laughs> Okay, press the record button. Now we're back. If we're going to do it, let's do it. And what you do, you don't have to talk about it. God sees it, and that's all that matters. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to go into details. You just seek the Lord with all of your heart. Who cares, who knows, and who doesn't? I'm trying to draw closer to Jesus. I think it's time to repent for a business-as-usual attitude. Repent for believing that we could bring the fire with ideas and programs and efforts. Repaired altars will see fresh fire. Let me just move forward here. When we fix our altar, God will fix what is broken in our lives and in our ministry. I feel that as a word of the Lord for somebody here today. That there's some things that are broken in your life. Can I tell you, if you'll repair that broken altar, God will fix everything else that's broken. Your self-esteem, your self-worth, your destiny. God will fix whatever it is that's broken in your life if you will set your heart in this season to repair that broken down altar. Because every one of us in this building has things that are broken. And God specializes in repairing and restoring what's broken down. But I'm giving somebody a fast track to that here today. If you repair that broken altar, you'll look over your life and see that God's repaired everything else that was broken. We have to repair, repent before revival can come. Let me, let me move forward here. The third thing, not only did he repair the altar and make a trench, but he prepared the wood. The wood is a type of Calvary. Can I tell you that Christianity without the cross is no longer Christianity? The message of the cross of Jesus is fundamental to our faith. Because if Jesus would have never been crucified on that cross and shed his blood, you and our sins would have never been forgiven. If he would not have hung there and endured the pain and the shame and the suffering of that Roman form of torture, you and I would not be saved and walking with the ability to have eternal life deposited down inside of us. It's because of the cross. And contrary to how some view the cross, it's not a place of weakness, it's a place of power. We are delivered because of the cross. We have victory because of the cross. We have access to God's presence and every promise because of the cross. How many of you are grateful for the cross of Jesus here today? I'm grateful for Calvary. I'm thankful for the blood. All of that is available because of the cross of Jesus. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I'm not talking about a cross that hangs on a wall. I'm not talking about a cross that dangles around your neck. I'm talking about the cross that Jesus died on, paving a way for our salvation. There's power in the cross of Jesus. For us, it's power. To talk about the cross brings power. It brings deliverance. It brings healing. To the world, it's foolishness. To the world, it doesn't fit their life. But to you and I that are being saved, it's the power of God. The prophet Elijah need the wood in order to offer a sacrifice. If there was no wood, there was no sacrifice. And if there was no sacrifice, guess what? There's no fire. The wood or the cross in the life of the believer represents Sacrifice. Someone say sacrifice. It means paying a price. And I tell you, if you're going to see God move mightily in your life, it's going to cost you something. This is the trouble that we have today in the church of the day and in America in general is we don't like to pay a price. We don't like it to cost us anything. We want to take a magic pill and be healthy and not put the work in. We want to have an amazing marriage and well-behaved children and just magically it just happens overnight when those kinds of things take work. It's the same thing in the church. We want the anointing of God on our life. We want the glory to fall just because we grabbed the microphone. But it costs. Oh, gosh, I could stand up here and tell you the price that you will have to pay for the anointing to be upon you. Oh, it's a costly thing. The suffering, the loneliness, the rejection, the misunderstanding, the hurts along the way, all of that is part of the package. It's part of the price tag. Today we don't want to talk about, we want, we want the freebies. We'll stand, in all, we'll stand in line all day if it's free. It's free. What, what, what is it? I don't know, but it's free. Just get in line. <laughs> and, then, and then we want everything else that way. We want free. But how many of you know that, that good things cost? Valuable things cost. This is not cheap to have your family all next to you in this church serving the Lord. It's going to cost you. For your marriage to get out of that rut that is in right now, it's going to cost you. For your kids to get off of drugs and become saints of the most high God, it's going to cost you. If you're going to reach that place and make an impact for his kingdom, I'm here to tell you, it's going to cost you. You're going to have to pay a price. Let me hurry. A crossless Christianity is a lifeless Christianity. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 16 and 24. Look at what he said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If we're going to be true followers of Jesus, we have to take up our cross. That cross symbolizes a price that we got to pay. The duties of a disciple. The disciplines of a disciple. Every single day, it's a cross that we have to carry. And if we're going to see the fire fall in our lives, in our ministries, and in our church, we're going to need some wood. In other words, it's going to cost us something. Revival comes when a price has been paid. When we put our personal agendas to one side and denied ourselves and taken up our crosses and followed Jesus wherever it leads us, no matter the cost, then revival will come. And for this reason, I believe we haven't experienced the revival that God wants to send us. Because we want fire, but with no sacrifice. We want Christian living, but without the cross. We want a visitation of God's spirit but without sanctification and true holiness. But first, the wood, and then the fire.
if the pianist would come and begin to play. Preparing the word means looking at Calvary, taking the cross of Christ and following him no matter the sacrifices we have to make. It represents the denying of ourselves, losing our life to gain his, decreasing so he can increase. It means putting my focus on Jesus and what he's done for me. The fire falling is an act of God in response to us being willing to put something on the altar. And in this month of consecration, I'm appealing to you today as your pastor, let's lay some things on the altar this month. Some of us need to put our family on the altar. Some of us need to put our future on the altar. Some of us need to put some things that, that we don't necessarily need in our life and just leave it there at the altar so that God can deal with it, so that we can focus exclusively on him. This is the kind of thing that God is asking us to do. What are you going to lay on the altar this month? What are you going to put aside and say, God, I'm going to seek you like I never sought you before. I'm going to pray like I've never prayed before. I'm going to eliminate from my life whatever I have to that's taking me away from seeking God. That is what you call consecration. Whatever doesn't fit, whatever doesn't please God, whatever's contrary to his word, putting it aside because I want to seek him. And I'm telling you, it's the, it'll be the greatest experience of your life because many of us, before we experience God's goodness, had to lay some things down. Some of us thought we couldn't live without this. We couldn't live without that person. We couldn't live without that thing. And all of a sudden, we laid it on the altar, and guess what? God's fire came and consumed that sacrifice, filled our lives, gave us purpose, gave us direction, and we realized, I don't need those kinds of things anymore. All I have is Jesus, and he's all that I need. And I close with this. The last thing, he poured water on the sacrifice. We've talked about prayer We've talked about the altar. Let me just finish here with this last thing. The water is a type of the word of God. Someone say the word of God. The scripture will bear witness in verses 34 and 35 of 1 Kings 18. That the prophet poured water on the sacrifice once, twice, and then a third time. Why is this important? Because that's how the word of God works in our lives. Step by step, it cleans it purifies. It does a work of sanctification through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let me prove it to you. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. Watch what the Apostle Paul says. That he might sanctify, talking about the church, and cleanse her with what? The washing of the water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. That's the church that Jesus is trying to produce in this hour. A holy church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. But you want to know how we get sanctified? You want to know how we get cleansed? Through the word. Someone say the word. That she should be holy and without blemish. This is what I call holiness that's produced by the word. Can I tell you that true holiness and sanctification comes through the word? It's not anything that we do. Can I tell you, let me just ruin somebody's little theology here for a second. Can I tell you, you can't make yourself holy. There's nothing that I do to make myself holy. I get into the presence of a holy God, and guess what he does? He purifies. He sanctifies. And one of the ways he does it, he does it through his word. 
We understand the process of sanctification by the Holy Ghost. But here Paul is talking about the work that God does by his word. This is holiness that can only be produced by the word. This church that is glorious in his eyes will one day stand before him with no spot or wrinkle and be holy without blemish. But all these can only be accomplished through the sanctifying, cleansing, and washing power of the word. Look at what Jesus said in John 15 and 3. He says, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. For this reason, church, we preach and we teach the word of God in this church. Why? Because it sanctifies. It cleanses the church. You see, that, that's why some of us here are here today because God wanted to cleanse you with his word today. Did you know that while you were sitting here, you're being sanctified by the word? That's why some of us were getting a little uncomfortable there. Why? Because how many of you moms and dads know that when you're washing those kids, sometimes they get a little squirrely. Mommy, daddy, you're scrubbing too hard. It's because you're dirty. Some of you got older kids, you forgot that season already. You're like, what is he talking about? Some of us are in smack dab in the middle of that season right now. That's why when I was preaching a few moments ago, some of us were like, oh, pastor, it hurts. Sit there. It's because he's washing you and sanctifying you and cleansing you. How? Through the word as it's being preached and taught. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. And I say that to also say, that's why you need to be here on Thursdays and Sundays. What does our cars and trucks look like when we haven't taken them through the wash? Give you a couple of months, man, and we'll be in July and August, and our cars will be covered, and we got to go to the car wash and get them cleansed. That's what happens when we come to church on Sundays and Thursdays. The word is preached. The word is taught. The spirit of God moves, and we're cleansed. We're sanctified. We're purified by the washing of the water of the word. Stand with me today. That's why if I were you, I wouldn't miss a Thursday or a Sunday. You can't afford to. Well, pastor, I got a Bible at home. Wonderful. You read that there, and you grow in your Christian walk, but you also get sanctified and cleansed by the preached and taught word of God. I know that's new to somebody, but it's in your Bible. So today, the word of God has been sanctifying us. It's been cleansing us. And like medicine, we don't want to take it, but we need it. And maybe somebody walked in here today and said, I, I was looking for a more upbeat message. This message has the power to change your life forever. And I tell you by the Holy Ghost that today there's going to, sh there's going to be a shift that's going to happen. For so many people in this room, where we're going to set ourselves to seek the Lord through prayer, through the word. So we'll repair our altars. We'll repent before the Lord and separate ourselves. We'll let the water come of his word and sanctify us and cleanse us. And then what's going to happen? The fire is going to fall. How will we know the fire will, is going to fall, Pastor? You'll know when it comes. But before that happens, we've got to do our part. So I share this message with you today, not because I'm angry, not because I'm upset. I do it by obedience to the word of the Lord. That God is trying to prepare this church, prepare us for a supernatural thing. But we've got to also do our part. We've got to consecrate ourselves. We've got to pick up our prayer life. We've got to pick up our Bible again. Get into that word more than we ever have before. Got to turn off the TV. Got to shut off the Wi-Fi for a couple hours. Say, guys, we're going to get together and study the word together as a family. We're going to seek the Lord. Why? Because we want our children to know that Jesus is a priority for us. And ingrain in them the necessity of getting into his word. I wonder if we could throw up our hands for just a few moments right now. Could you close your eyes as the Holy Ghost has already been touching hearts and searching hearts right now? 
Conviction is beginning to rise up in many of us in this room today in recognition that there's some things that we got to lay aside if we're going to draw closer to the Lord. But right now, for a few moments, I want you to lift up those hands and say, God, I want to draw closer to you. Whatever it takes, Lord, I want to draw closer to you. Could you do that wherever you find yourself right now in your relationship with the Lord? Could you throw those hands up and surrender and your eyes closed and say, God, I want to draw closer to you. I want to draw closer to you today, Lord. I, I, there's some things, God, that have been trying to hold me back, but I'm putting all that to one side because my heart desires to draw closer to you. I wonder if somebody could just lift up their voices just for a few more moments. If the fire is going to fall, if God's spirit is going to move, if miracles are going to happen, if blessings are going to flow, we got to first build up an altar. We're going to make up in our minds, God, we're going to seek you. We're going to seek you like we never have before, at least for some, like we haven't in a long time. God, we're going to seek you with everything that we have. We've got distracted. We've got complacent. We've neglected our spiritual disciplines. But Lord, you're calling us to consecration. And we're setting our hearts and our minds to seek you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what I feel to do today in the Holy Ghost. I want to invite to this altar area here today everyone in this building that is serious about seeking the Lord that's saying pastor I, I, I may not know all these things that you're talking about but, but I, I want to draw closer to the Lord and, and in this month I'm going to make an effort whatever that looks like to draw closer to him if that's you I want you to come and stand at this